Wasn't that a wonderful brain stimulating talk? Don't you wish you had a paleo baby? I did. I had two non-paleo babies, so I was like, ah. So uh, thank you so much, Amber, for all your insights and sharing your story. So we are going to be begin the second talk today, and we're going to continue on the theme of babies and brains, and we're going to go into breast milk. Um, let's welcome Megan Sanctuary. She has a master's, and she's a PhD candidate at currently at UC Davis. She's a member of the Milk Group, which has been decoding mother's milk for clues um, over the last decade. She's currently using basic science information to develop new human trials, and I think this will just be mind-blowing, so we can really learn the connections with um, ancestral health um, and um, the microbiome. So our talk today from Megan will be the human milk-oriented microbiota, babies and beyond. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here and to talk to you guys today um, about the human milk-oriented microbiota. And this is a concept that we've been developing in our milk group again over the past decade. And uh, I'm working with a very integrative team. So we've been looking at multiple, as multiple aspects of human milk um, from composition and as well as sociolog sociological things like um, uh, connection between mother and infant. But today I'm going to talk to you about a small piece of that puzzle um, looking at the components of human milk that help to shape the microbiota in the infant, um, and then how we've been sort of applying this basic science research that we've um, discovered into and translating that into clinical research. And so I'm going to start um, giving a little overview of this idea of mother's milk as a model. So we've been using studying lactation, studying the composition of mother's milk, both in humans and in other species, as a model for an evolutionarily optimal diet. And of course, mammals are the only animals that lactate. So this is a feature um, later on in, in evolution that has developed. And so there are several advantages of being a mammal. Um, the first is live birth. So opposed to other animals, non-mammals, um, before the advent of mammals, uh, birth was pretty much sterile. So things like egg laying didn't allow for the transfer of microorganisms and um, the offspring were inoculated from microorganisms from the environment. So the advent of live birth actually allowed for the direct transfer of microbial ecosystems from the parent to the offspring. And this actually allowed for the development of a more advanced symbiotic relationship between microorganisms and their hosts. Um, in addition to live birth, um, extended periods of care for young also enabled ma mammalian offspring to be born um, less developed and um, better able to grow and develop over a longer period of time. This also necessitated the need for a provision of a very nutritious um, diet for offspring that are so immature and vulnerable and have such immature digestive tracts, for one. Um, and so milk provides that uh, very complete, comprehensive source of nutrition and also um, allows the mammalian offspring to actually be buffered from any sort of perturbations in their environment. So the mother can be in a very nutrient, plentiful, enriched environment, collect nutrients, and store them for delivery to the infant at a later time. So therefore, ma mammals can actually raise their children in um, less stable environments than other animals can. So they can occupy more niches. So we're using this idea of this relationship between the mother and the offspring um, as an evolutionary lens to see the preventative potential of not only human milk, but other milks. So human milk has been under this very direct evolutionary pressure to be a complete source of nutrition for human infants. And it is really the only food that is actually inherently nutritious. So we talk about really nutrient-dense diets, um, plant and animal-based diets that are really high in nutrient content. Um, but an but uh, obviously, plant-based diets, uh, plants did not evolve to be eaten. And they often have chemical defenses that prevent digestion of those components and uh, reduce the bioavailability of those nutrients. And even animal food diets, um, 
first you have to catch the animal, <laughs> and then it has to be properly prepared, and you need to eat you know, certain parts of the animal and all, in order to get the, all the nutrient benefits. So really, milk is the only substance that's evolved to actually be inherently nutritious. So we can use human milk um, to study the structure-function relationships between food, microbiota, and host health. And if we, we study this relationship in the infant, um, it has the advantage over other dietary models of milk being the sole, sor sole food source for the first four to six months of life. So you can take away all the other dietary confounding factors in order to get at the, at the root of um, these relationships. In addition, we can also look to milk um, for insights into sort of evolutionary optimal development in general. So for example, human milk contains a lot of components that help the development of the gut. So a lot of trophic factors, hormones, um, and other uh, immune factors that help protect the gut and, um, and promote the development of the gut since infants are born with such an immature gut. So that tells you how important the gut is for the overall health of the organism if milk preferentially is promoting the development of that organ system. So that takes us to the idea that all disease begins in the gut, as Hippocrates said, and thus all health begins in the gut as well. So there's many functions of the gut that are necessary for the health of the overall health of the organism. So the first is digestion. So if you don't have proper digestion, you're not going to be able to extract the nutrients from the food matrix that you're consuming. Um, and undigested food can actually move down into the large bowel and potentially disrupt the microbiota if you're improperly digesting your food. In addition, uh, the vast majority of the immune system, 70% of the immune system, lies in the gut. Um, and so having dysfunction in your immune system in your gut can lead to, uh, obviously, all sorts of diseases, celiacs, Crohn's. Um, and then that brings me to the barrier function of the gut. So the gut is technically an external environment inside the body, and so you have to have an effective barrier to keep the things that need to be the unsterile environment of the gut out of the body system. And so the barrier function of the gut prevents autoimmunity, prevents um, translocation of bacteria into the body, as well as bacterial products such as LPS, which can cause systemic inflammation. So having effective gut barrier function is very important for overall health. And then finally, the microbiota, which of course has gained a lot of attention over the past decade, and we know now that microbial dysbiosis or an imbalance in those populations in the gut um, can predispose to diseases, especially during critical periods of development. So today I'll talk about how having a beneficial bacterial composition in the gut in infancy can actually be protective against future disease. So that brings us to what determines gut bacterial composition in infancy. And there are several positive factors that have um, a good influence on the infant microbiota, and then several negative factors um, which can be potentially problematic during this critical period. So the first set of factors is actually the maternal microbiota. So this is passed down from the mother to the infant, and whether or not she has a balanced or a disrupted microbiota can really influence the microbiota of the infant. Um, in addition, mode of delivery. So vaginal delivery, the infant is colonized by microbiota from the mother's um, vaginal canal and her gut, as, and in contrast to cesarean delivery, where infants are then colonized by the hospital flora, and those cannot be good. <laughs> um, in addition, the early environment. So someone was saying before about have a, how you, you know, wash everything, your first baby, but really having um, a non-sterile environment is important to expose them to microbes in the environment. Um, early antibiotic exposure is really becoming a problem now, especially with kids having weakened immune systems. Um, they get a, a lot of antibiotics really early in life, and this can just have a devastating effect on the microbiota, especially during this critical period. And today I'm going to be focusing on um, breastfeeding and the differences between breast and formula feeding and the actual components in breast milk that promote proper colonization of the infant gut. So I'm going to start by just giving you an overview of human milk for those that are less familiar with it. Um, so the main components, uh, the energy providing components first is lactose. It's the, <coughs> it has the, it's the most abundant component of milk. 
Um, and it's very digestible to the infant gut, which is very important since, again, infants have a very immature digestive tract. Uh, lipids are the second most abundant component of milk, and the lipid delivery system in milk is actually unique to any other biological system. So the milk fat globule is actually um, a vesicle that is part of the mammary epithelial tissue that is shed from the mammary gland and thus transports proteins and lipids that are actually found in the maternal mammary tissue cell uh, membrane things like sphingomyelins that are really important for neurodevelopment. And this is unique as other lipid particle delivery systems such as, you know, the lipoproteins um, <coughs> were already evolved. So this is like a unique, it uniquely evolved in milk to more effectively transport lipids. So it just sort of highlights the importance of lipid delivery in the infant. A protein would be the other energy carrying molecule. Um, two different types in milk. The first are casins, and they're highly digestible, and thus serve mainly as an amino acid source for the infant. And then whey proteins, which tend to be less digestible, and rightly so, as they are often immune factors. So lactoferrin, IgA, have actual biological activity in the gut, and so you don't want to digest them so that they maintain that activity and can exert effects in the gut. Um, lactoferrin not only delivers iron, but is also bactericidal, so it helps shape the infant gut microbiota. IgA is actually maternal in origin, so that the baby receives immunity to pathogens in the maternal environment, and thus is protected from pathogens that it, it is likely to encounter. Um, it is also important for developing tolerance to commensal um, organisms in the gut as well. In addition, um, a less known fact is that human milk actually contains digestive enzymes. So not only is the mother delivering all these nutrients to the baby, but also enzymes that help the baby digest it. Uh, of course, vitamins and minerals that are highly bioavailable, more than in any other food matrix. And then milk digested. So as um, milk components travel through the gut and become digested, they actually get more properties. So peptides that are released from the digestion of certain proteins have bioactive effects, many of them immune. And then milk is a dynamic fluid. So this is a very important component and, a pro and another big reason why there's a huge difference between human milk and formula because the human milk changes over time. So first, milk changes over the course of lactation. So in the first 24 to 48 hours, um, Colostrum is produced, which is very, very high in immune factors and low in other components. And then over the course of time, lactose increases and then decreases, whereas fat content tends to increase over the entire length of lactation. In addition, milk actually changes within a single feeding. So for milk here on the left is more dilute, high in lactose, whereas milk at the end of a feeding, the hind milk is actually higher in fat and thought to have um, a greater satiating effect um, for the end of the feeding. Um, and then the final component, which I waited till the end to introduce, which will be the, um, the component that I'm gonna focus on for the rest of my talk, are the human milk oligosaccharides. They are the third most abundant component of human milk after lipids and lactose, and they are complex sugars with distinct linkages that cannot be actually broken down by the enzymes present in the infant. Um, so there's this very abundant component of milk. It takes a lot of energy for the mom to produce it. So why make such a large amount of these sugars when the baby can't digest them, when it's not really nutritive for the baby? Well, the answer is in evolutionary symbiosis. So HMOs are effectively mother's fiber, um, also known as a prebiotic. So food for the bacteria in the gut. And what we found in our research um, using in vitro studies is that HMOs are found to selectively promote the growth of certain bacterial species actually to the exclusion of harmful species in vitro. So we did some culture studies looking at what type of bacteria are able to consume HMOs as the sole source of carbon. And we compared several different strains of bacteria that are present in the infant gut. All, the, all of these are bifidobacterial species, that's the B. And you can see that one in particular outcompetes the rest and is able to use HMOs as a sole source of carbon. So we did some further exploration to see what allows this particular bacteria to have such a niche in the gut. And what we actually discovered 
was a 40 kilobase pair, um, kilobase gene cluster in the genome of bifidobacteria that has all these genes that get turned on when HMOs are in the environment. So they have these binding proteins that allow for the identification of the HMOs in the environment, and they actually import these um, sugars inside, intracellularly into the bacteria before they're broken down by a host of glycolytic enzymes. And this is actually a unique strategy among gut bacteria, as most bacteria in the gut have extracellular proteases and glycolytic enzymes, and so they actually start degrading um, their food sources externally to them and then just import the pieces that they can metabolize. And this can be potentially problematic, especially in other probiotics maybe that you give it, um, that you give in the clinic, in that they will, they could potentially release monosaccharides and other components that would be digestible by other bacteria. So the fact that B. infantis can actually import this so it keeps all of the nutrients for itself. So it imports the entire molecule and thus doesn't leave pieces hanging around for other potentially pathogenic bacteria to consume. So this allows it to very effectively niche out other bacteria in the gut. So this is an overview of HMO structural diversity. Um, and this is, of course, in comparison to the fructo and galacto oligosaccharides that generally serve as fiber in foods like yogurt and also infant formula. And you can see the large contrast in structural complexity between these different types of fibers. And so this is not going to be selective for any particular kind of bacteria. Um, so that's why using HMOs in combination with um, bifidobacteria can be a unique combination to promote the growth specifically of those bacteria. And we've shown this in vivo. So this is a one-term infant um, showing the fecal HMO profile. So this is the HMOs that are coming out in the stool compared to the fecal bacterial profile. So you can see at week one, um, and everything's been normalized, the HMOs to week one, um, is very high in enterobacteriaceae, which um, are the normal primary first colonizers of the infant gut, but can be potentially pathogenic later on. So you can see um, as the HMOs begin to be sort of taken apart by bacteria, but not fully, and then as they go down, meaning they're being consumed by bacteria, you see this bloom of the bifidobacteria, and they dominate the gut then at later time points. So since this, these bifidobacteria are so predominant in the gut, we wanted to see what the benefits are to the gut um, of having those bacteria present. So we did some further in vitro studies examining the effects of this, of BIFs and HMOs on gut health. So first we looked at bacterial adhesion. So in order for bifidobacteria to influence the gut tissue, they have to bind. So we compared bifidobacteria to an, um, B. infantis to another bacteria, B. brevet, that is also found in the infant gut, and compared three different carbon sources that they're grown on to see if the carbon source influences basically the bacterial phenotype. And so here you can see only when B. infantis is grown on HMOs can it actually effectively bind to the intestinal epithelial cells. And this is important because binding allows for the interaction with the epithelial cell and actually changes the gene expression of the epithelial cell in the gut. So further studies looked at immune function of the epithelial cells in the intestine when they're exposed to this bacteria grown on HMOs. Okay. So this is a heat map of different, this is um, basically all inflammatory immune um, markers. And uh, blue is lower or reduced expression, where red is higher. So these three middle row columns are the bifidobacteria grown on HMOs. Again, this is expression in the epithelial cell. So you can see pretty much across the board a reduced expression of pro-inflammatory cytokine cascades in the epithelial cells. Um, when they're grown on HMOs and not necessarily other carbon sources. Um, we've also done studies looking at gut barrier integrity and actually shown that not in addition to these immune functions, you can actually increase the expression of your tight junction proteins that help maintain that gut barrier. And finally, there are additional effects of HMOs and bifidobacteria to gut health. 
One is that HMOs can actually reserve, serve as receptor decoys. So pathogens want to bind the sugars on your intestinal epithelial cells, and they'll similarly bind to the HMO and thus not be able to bind to your intestinal cell and flow right through. Uh, bifidobacteria can also lower the pH of the intestine, which additionally helps um, get rid of pathogens. So finally, taking this to the bedside. Um, so a population that we're really interested in studying are preterm infants. They're born with a very immature digestive tract and thus are prone to a lot of digestive dysfunction. And one of the most uh, lethal diseases that they tend to get is necrotizing enterocolitis. And this is the number one cause of death for preemies in the NICU after they've survived the first two weeks. Um, it's characterized by having dysbiosis in the intestinal tract as well as an exuberant pro-inflammatory cascade. So we thought this would be the perfect um, situation in which to use B. infantis to try and reduce some of that inflammation. So we started off using um, a, a rat model of necrotizing enterocolitis. And here we have rat pups that are born one day um, early in gestation. And here you have three different groups. So the dam fed are the ones receiving solely mother's milk formula fed and compared to formula fed plus B infantis. So you can see that dam fed animals actually have no incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis, where when you start feeding formula, it jumps up to nearly 80%. And this is actually very relevant for human preterm babies, as a lot of mothers who have preterm infants um, either can't produce enough milk and thus the infants need to be supplemented with formula, or even if they can, the protein content of their milk is so low that they have to be supplemented with formula protein in order to maintain growth rates. Um, so that's one of the main problems with feeding formula in, in preemies. So then you can see, once you supplement with B. infantis, a remarkable reduction in your neck incidence. Um, some of the, the mechanism behind this could could potentially be the reduction in that pro-inflammatory cascade. So here again, the same three groups. And again, uh, formula fed very high in pro-inflammatory cytokines, IL-6, CXCL1, and TNF-alpha, and then attenuation of that response with probiotic supplementation. So to this point, um, we've discussed the positive external influences on the milk-oriented microbiota, the key players of which being bifidobacteria, what I've mainly been talking about, but bacteroides also plays a role as well as um, lactobacillus and how the milk-oriented microbiota um, promotes the development of gut structure, the immune system, and then also metabolism. And all these things come together to influence neurodevelopment. But it's still a question um, as to whether, as to how much the microbiota act during this critical period of development actually influences neurodevelopment. Um, so this is my particular area of research. Um, and my interest is in the gut microbiota and neurodevelopment, and specifically the milk-oriented microbiota, so the select groups of bacteria and their influence on the gut-brain axis. So there's multiple pathways that connect the gut to the brain, um, and they're bidirectional. So you actually get this crosstalk between the gut and the brain that goes both ways. The most direct um, connection is the vagal nerve. And this directly connects the enteric to the central nervous system. Um, but immune signaling, so cytokines, can be released from the gut, circulate through the body, and can actually pass through the blood-brain barrier um, to influence brain function, as well as hormones circulating from the gut as well. In addition, the microbiota can actually produce neurotransmitters. So they produce catecholamines, serotonin, gamma aminobutyric acid, and dopamine, and actually the gut sources of serotonin is the highest source in the body. In addition, the microbiota also produce short-chain fatty acids, and these have been shown to be able to leave the gut, um, circulate systemically, and also pass through the blood-brain barrier in order to influence neurotransmitter production. There's also some animal models um, of the HPA axis, which suggests that having um, an intact microbiota is important for the functioning of that axis. So germ-free animals compared to conventional animals have disruptions in the HPA a axis and can often um, express more anxiolytic behavior, and that can actually be attenuated by probiotic supplementation, and they've shown in rats that germ-free rats, well, if you actually give them B. infantis particularly, um, it attenuates and gets rid of that um, anxiolytic effect. 
And finally, just the presence of psychiatric comorbidities, just the fact that people who suffer from celiacs, IBS, and different intestinal problems often have cognitive dysfunction associated with those, and the vice versa is also is true. So people with schizophrenia and autism also experience gastrointestinal dysfunction. So there's something going on with this connection. So I'm particularly interested in the gut-brain axis of children with autism spectrum disorders. And there's two important components to this uh, disease. The first is the neurological dysfunction, which most people are familiar with. But what is less known is that a lot of these kids also have an altered microbiota that is actually low in bifidobacteria. So they experience high prevalence of gastrointestinal symptoms, most commonly chronic constipation, diarrhea, IBS, which is pain associated with stooling, excessive vomiting and acid reflux, and the degree of this intestinal dysfunction has actually been associated with autism severity. Therefore, a good protocol might be to try to treat these kids with B. infantis plus these milk oligosaccharides to see if we can attenuate some of these gastrointestinal dysfunction and whether that has an effect on behavior. So we designed um, a study looking at, again, children with autism with gastrointestinal symptoms and supplementing them with either the symbiotic, which is the combination of the probiotic B. infantis with our prebiotic. Um, in our case, we use bovine colostrum as a source of bovine milk oligosaccharides. Um, so at this point, we can't feed kids human milk oligosaccharides, uh, but bovine milk oligosaccharides are similar in structure. Um, they're just a lot more dilute, and they don't have as much structural diversity as humans, but um, the bifidobacteria can grow on them as well. So we did a double-blind randomized crossover study looking at each of these treatments over five-week periods with a two-week washout in between, looking for changes in GI symptoms and behavioral changes, as well as collection of biological specimens that we hope to gain some insight into the mechanisms behind any outcomes that we see. So we had a total enrolled of eight subjects, um, ranging in age from four to 11, um, with very heterogeneous gastrointestinal symptoms. So a lot of constipation and diarrhea, some had both, some had pain, gas and bloating as well. So the uh, preliminary data that we have so far shows in general, across the board, a reduction in gastrointestinal symptoms. So significantly a reduction in diarrhea and more so on the prebiotic only arm compared to the symbiotic arm, but you still see a reduction on both arms, as well as pain was statistically significant as well. Um, and again, there is a trend toward a decrease in symptoms across the board, but we have such a low sample size that it wasn't statistically significant. In terms of behavioral results, um, we didn't see any differences on two of the assessment systems we use, um, but we did see an improvement in aberrant behavior. So this is an improvement in total score, significantly on the prebiotic only arm, um, in areas such as irritability, stereo stereotomy, which is repetitive behavior, hyperactivity, um, and then lethargy actually improved more on the symbiotic arm. Um, so this gives us the idea that there might be something going on with this gut-brain axis and the bifidobacteria, and that the HMOs or the BMOs on their own might be having an effect. So study conclusions, um, overall most children showed greater improvement on the prebiotic only arm, which we thought was, was really unexpected. We, we thought the combination of the two would be better, so we're still trying to um, explore biological specimens to see if we can find some mechanisms behind that effect. And then this is the really important part, actually. No matter what our statistics show, all parents wanted to continue providing supplement to their child. And if you think about these families, these kids have autism. A lot of these families actually have multiple kids with autism. And they're also struggling with these really bad gastrointestinal symptoms. So I've had, I had kids in the study who um, had bowel movements less than twice a week. So dealing with that on top of the autism and not having any, really anywhere to go, you know, going to gastroenterologists and not really ha finding many answers, trying every drug that they can and not getting any results for years and years having these problems, then finally something works and a lot of these parents are begging me to provide them with more supplements. So just that alone, um, anecdotally, I feel is uh, very important. So again, the study goal is to complete analysis of our biological specimens in order to gain a mechanistic insight of what's going on. 
And then conclusions, um, again, just this idea of using milk as a model. So milk is obviously very important for infants, but we can also use it as a scientific model to discover other aspects of um, evolutionarily optimal human development. Uh, recommendations on breastfeeding. So I think this is at the heart of my talk, um, that breastfeeding is so important, and a lot of women don't know really all the differences between breast milk and formula in order to make an informed decision about whether to breastfeed. And there are a lot of barriers to breastfeeding that need to be overcome. One is that lack of knowledge, but there's also socioeconomic dis um, barriers, such as women, of course, needing to return to the workplace shortly after birth, as well as not having facilities, time, or a place to pump in private once they return to work. And so really breaking down these barriers is what's going to allow breastfeeding to continue and be optimal in the future. Um, we can also use these studies to inform fortification of formula. While formula will never be breast milk, um, in regard to my current talk, the current dietary recommendations for infants for fiber is zero grams per day. So this is very dated information and has not been updated to reflect our new knowledge on human milk. And so there's also a lot more that we need to know about human milk, how diet influences the composition. We just have very scant data on that, as well as environmental factors and how they influence milk production and composition. So there's a lot more to learn here, and I'm excited to move forward with this in the future. So with that, I'll take any questions. Uh, thank you. That was a great talk. Uh, like, unbelievable morning. Um, another little known fact about breast milk is, and it is um, now they're looking in to see if it's oligosaccharides that confers this property, but a number of in vitro studies show that it's less cariogenic or cavity causing than formula, of course, um, or regular milk, um, if it's not given along with uh, baby food that has sugar in it. So, right. um, and another thing that I th think most people don't know that breast milk's loaded with bacteria from the mother's flora. Right. Um, and the interaction of the mother's flora within the milk and the oligosaccharides is probably what inhibits tooth decay. So. That's I what I was going to say. I was like, I think the bacteria in the milk are probably having a, playing a role in that. Mm, absolutely. Hi. I Hi. <laughs> I enjoyed your talk. I'm oh, a, thank you. I am a neonatal ICU nurse, and um, there have been a lot of changes in the last 25 years, um, good changes, but have you ever studied donor breast milk? Um, they're starting that now. So at the NICUs in UC Davis, um, they're actually, they just started mandating that all preterm infants receive some human milk. So they actually have established a donor bank in their NICU um, that they're hoping to expand. And so now all preterm infants um, do receive human milk of some type. Uh, the question now remains as to the processing of that. So all donor milk needs to be pasteurized. Um, because it is from another mom and there could be, you know, other bacteria in there that are pathogenic. And so there is pasteurization, but we don't know what the effect of that is on the milk composition, especially I'm mostly worried about the proteins and the milk fat globule, which is so fragile. Um, so that hasn't been explored. And of course, then you lose all that bacterial uh, protection that could be in there too. So it's a step in the right direction but we just don't know what the impact of that is. Right, we, we have a milk bank at our hospital, and I was just wondering about the pasteurization and how it destroys all the good beneficial bacteria. Um, and we have a lot of moms that use the donor breast milk because it takes time for their milk to come in, mm -hmm. and like you said, if we're advancing feedings um, before their milk supply can catch up with that, right. Um, then we end up using the donor breast milk. Another thing that we do use that I would be interested in um, learning about is the um, human milk fortifier. Right. Um, a lot of our babies tend to have problems with that. Exactly, and, exactly. Um, and yet we add it, we continue to add it, the neonatologist when it added for the extra calories. Right. So anyway, just, you know, it's really interesting, but. Right, I'm wondering about that protein because they have found um, in babies who've had neck, 
um, and it's been lethal to them that they do see this dysbiotic bacteria in regions of the gut and there are bovine milk proteins associated with that dysbiosis. So it could be the type of protein that we're feeding them and it could be even the processing of that protein that's the problem because formula protein is highly, highly processed, right. really, really damaged. Um, and so that might be part of the problem and maybe if we could figure out a better way to either process that protein or find a different protein source that's more tolerable to those babies might be something we need to explore. But that's definitely been a problem in our NICUs as well because there's just not enough protein in the milk that's being produced, even if they are producing the right kind of milk and in the right amounts, just the fact that the baby is supposed to be in utero growing and right. is now ex utero trying to grow when it's not really supposed to be see receiving this food source yet at that point. Um, yeah, it's just this really new population that we're still trying to figure out exactly what their nutrient needs are. And I even wonder if, you know, by trying to meet the growth curves of a term infant, whether we might be overfeeding them protein because we're scared that they're not getting enough just to try and meet these growth curves. Because for a while, we even thought that formula, that breastfed infants weren't getting enough energy because they weren't meeting the growth curves of the formula-fed infants, when now it seems that, like it might be the reverse problem. So, right. yeah. All right, well, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for your talk. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything I can extrapolate um, from your talk as an adult who is not breastfed, formula fed, born in 1960, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of antibiotics, a lot of digestive problems um, that I've been unable to resolve, other health issues. Right. Um, yeah, so I have been asked this question a lot, whether this is applicable to adult populations since this is um, an infant bacteria. Um, there have been some trials, I believe, that are starting in adults with irritable bowel syndrome, um, and they seem to see an improvement, especially in symptoms of diarrhea. Um, but I think it's just really understudied at this point. There's not a lot of research. Um, my personal opinion is that I still think it would be beneficial for adults. Um, and it might be on more of an individual basis. So they've been doing a lot of studies now. Um, we have really uh, the top microbiologists at UC Davis, and we've been exploring exactly what probiotics do in the gut and how they fix gut function. And we're now getting to the point where we think it not, might not be specific bacteria, but specific functions of those bacteria. So you actually need to profile the sort of metagenomics, so what the bacteria in the gut are capable of doing and see where particular people are lacking and then find a bacteria that has that functioning and filling in the niche. So it's more of a, a functional microbiota that we need to look at now rather than the species that are in it because really no two people have the same microbiota. It's really as individualized as a fingerprint. And now, but on a global level, the functions of those microbiota are the same. So now we might not be getting down to who should be there, but what they should be doing. So it's going to be on a really individual basis that we're going to have to look at the functions of the microbiota in people and really see what they're lacking and then really give personalized um, therapies for that. And I would guess that's not available yet. No. <laughs> we are still just in the beginning stages of figuring that out. I so. mean, is there any harm in trying the B infantis with I mean, um, I, my best bet would actually be to try the colostrum, oh, okay. and it is commercially available, um, and I can provide you with the information for that, so you can actually buy it commercially um, and take it as a liquid, and it does have not only the oligosaccharides, but a lot of immune factors in it that might also help with inflammation and stuff okay, that's going yeah, on. Okay, I would like to get that from you. Okay, okay great. Thank you. Thank you, that was awesome. Thank you. Uh, so I'm a doula in Portland, Oregon, so I work with women a lot oh, who great. are having babies Yay, and trying doulas. to breastfeed. <laughs> so, so my question is that, you know, you do see a lot of women, I mean, it's really common, you know, GBS is really common. You see, you know, dysbiosis, vaginal, uh, bacteria, uh, vaginosis is really common. Um, and then they're giving vaginal births or, you know, conversely, uh, cesareans. Mm -hmm. So my question is, do you think that breastfeeding, when babies go through that sort of process, even though they may be cultivated with like um, least ideal bacteria, do you think that because 
breast milk is so specific to um, Bifida infantis that that's going to boost that population enough to sort of outweigh the co the um, not the what's right. the word I'm looking for not the benefit but the the negative the negative impacts right. of these other bacteria. Um, so that's an interesting question, and we've been looking into it a little bit. Uh, the fact that there are actually differences in microbial populations in the gut of infants in the U.S. versus other populations. And um, some babies that are breastfed don't have any bifidobacteria at all to begin with. And so just feeding breast milk um, doesn't seem to actually populate them with bifidobacteria. Hmm. So that begs the question then of whether breast milk actually contains bifidobacteria if they're delivered via breast milk or whether there's just bacteria on the surface of the breast that's getting like the skin that was gonna be bacteria because <laughs> it's actually really hard to figure that out because right. collecting breast milk sterile is almost impossible to right. do right um so with that in mind there are i still think breastfeeding um is going to be optimal i wouldn't i wouldn't be afraid of you know the hmos uh potentially promoting growth of the bifs but if you don't have any BIFs to begin with, you might not get them. And so we're currently running studies actually looking at um, maternal supplementation of bifidobacteria oh. and whether that can transfer to the infant either vaginally or whether supplementing cesarean-born infants with bifidobacteria might help. So we might actually start giving, you know, screening infants for bifidobacteria when they're born and then either supplementing the mother or supplementing the infant directly. Okay. Yeah, that's super interesting. And then one really quick thing, just in terms of breastfeeding, there is a huge increase, at least with the population I work with, which is a pretty specific demographic, people that can afford to hire a doula. Right. But there's a huge interest in breastfeeding, but what we're seeing is that actually a lot of women have, like physically cannot produce enough milk due to right. other sort of evolutionary health things like insulin resistance or just the lack of mammary tissue, um, you know, hormonal imbalances as a kid when they developed and their breast tissue did or didn't develop. Right. So there, there's, I think there's an interesting swing as, as breastfeeding becomes more popular of sort of a shame that happens when women can't yes, produce the milk that they want to for their children. So it's an interesting balance. And I think that those things are definitely really related to, to, um, sort of like a evolutionary health too, and mm -hmm. that's an, it's an interesting place to be as a doula to try to support people's decisions, and also encourage you know maybe a different right. lifestyle and dietary. Right, and that's a very interesting area of research. Also, we don't really know, you know, what maybe there's dietary factors that mm -hmm. contribute to your ability to reduce milk, and there just haven't been enough studies, mm -hmm. so we can't really recommend yeah. things. But I'm sure there's there's something that yeah. can help with that. We just yeah. We're not sure what it yeah. is yet. So that's a really important area of research, yeah. I think. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, that was absolutely a really awesome talk. Thank you. <laughs> um, in your practice and um, in the clinical trials, do you do nutrigenomics where you look at the FET2 status of the moms um, or the NEC babies? Um, we haven't for this study. It's basically been a financial limitation more than anything else. But usually we do. We look at the secretor status uh -huh. um, to see you know, what type of, of HMOs are being produced and whether that's protective or not. Um, so if we can get some more funding, uh, yeah, we can exactly. look at that. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly that yeah. would be so definitely FET2, interesting to look at. So um, FET2 is uh, how much fucose and it's the fiber you make on your mucosal transferase, lining. Yeah. Right. So what do you find? They're, most of them are uh, compromised, not, not their non-secretor status? So for this study, I don't know because okay. we haven't um, looked. I'm trying to think if there's anything in autism in general I think there's more non-secretors, yeah. Probably more non-secretors, right. right. So I'm actually founder of the Gut Institute, <laughs> and I have a formula, a, a formula for a probiotic that I formulated, and it's based on breast milk. Oh, great. European human breast milk, not American, <laughs> where the bifidos are extinct <laughs> from our awful right. SAD diets, right? <laughs> um, so in Europe, they tend to be healthier, less pesticides, less GMOs, and the guts are healthier. So the moms are healthier, and the mom's breast milk, and their boobies are healthier. So oh, if people nice. are interested, it's on my website. It's called Bifido Maximus, and it has B. infantis, okay. Bifidobacterium infantis, and mm -hmm. a huge dose of bifidal longum, because as okay. you mentioned, the oligosaccharide is completely upregulated. Um, right. There's a bifido shunt in bifidos. So, so many Americans now, they can't break down sugars, simple sugars. They hang around and then they cause uh, portal vein problems, um, pancreatic problems, fatty liver. But when you have the right bifidos in your gut that mom should have handed down to you, which she should have got from her mom, so this is grandma legacy, which is very right. ancestral, right, in our mm -hmm. paleo world, um, the bifido shunt will remove the simple sugars and make right. them into magic. Okay. Right? Oh, nice. 
Yeah, so okay. yeah, our formula is actually the highest con commercial concentration um, for, for these. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the Gut Institute. I just have a quick question to the group in here. We've, we're wondering about the temperature in this room. Can you raise your hand if you think it's too cold? Okay, raise your hand if you think it's too warm. <laughs> okay, so the people who think it's too warm move to the front, I guess. And, um, would it, if we turn the temperature up to like two degrees in here, do you think that would be okay for